Hello everyone, um, I'm Hema Reddy. I've been with IBM for about um, six and a half years now. Have been working on cell processor for uh, close to one and a half to two years. Uh, <clears throat> moved over from system I and P series. I uh, used to write device drivers and firmware microcode and then just took a position with uh, programming on cell processor. That being said, I'll just quickly go over what is exactly included in the development kit right now. This is the most accessible vehicle that's available to everyone because um, uh, not everyone has a cell blade and I think the Sony PlayStation 3 is not available yet in India. So if you have to buy it over here, I guess you have to go to eBay or something like that and, and God forbid if something goes wrong, uh, there's no help <laughs> or support. Um, so far, Sony or Toshiba have not committed if the plans are going to change or what. So the only form factor that's available in India would be purchase of a blade. That's a QS20 uh, product offering from IBM uh, website. So meanwhile, before then, if uh, you, know, you wanted to get, a, get your feet wet, uh, we have a very, um, very useful um, kit that is the development kit that's available. Um, via the developer works website, the links uh, that Duke showed earlier in his presentation. Um, the reliability of these results is very close to the, I don't know, to an actual cell blade, up to 99.99% accuracy. So in other words, if you have some code that is compiled to be built on the cell system simulator and you're getting some performance results out, uh, it cannot be a big application because obviously the cell system simulator can only take you so far, but uh, just to test out some general uh, routines, algorithms, the results are pretty accurate. When you take the same code and the same executable and you run it on the cell blade, um, you can get comparable results. And talking of cell blades, we do have something called virtual loaner program. So if you are curious in testing out your code, uh, if you have some algorithm that you want to run it on a cell blade, then do uh, get in contact with us. We can get you set up with the loaner program so you can get a taste of how the hardware runs. So today I will be covering uh, the development kit and also some basic programming concepts, um, some uh, communication mechanisms on cell, why it's different from other, say, Intel multi-core architectures, uh, the strong points, and, um, and some synchronization mechanisms. Obviously, when there's communication involved in a real application, there will be some synchronization overhead. So we'll go over that. And that followed by some uh, examples and on the cell system simulator in the programming hands-on session in the afternoon. Development kit uh, offers, has support for x86. So if you have your uh, Linux, it doesn't have support yet. There's no tool chain yet for Windows development. Um, so the limitation is that it has to be Linux. x86, 64-bit operating system, or any PowerPC box. Um, it's got support, it's got lots of software libraries. In the afternoon, uh, we will be going over the, the directory tree structure for the simulator and see where everything is, what are the libraries currently uh, uh, there. There's lots of workloads that have already been optimized. You know, so when, uh, in the afternoon, when you have your systems in the lab, you can look, there's quite a few workloads that have been optimized so we can get, uh, we can take a look at what the cell uh, code looks like, okay? It's got some support for the, some profiling tools, uh, debug tools. Uh, recently, with this SDK 2.0, we have uh, released an Eclipse-based IDE environment that makes it a little more uh, GUI-based. So for those of you who are more comfortable with GUI-based development, there is an interface available that you can use to your advantage. And talking of libraries, there is a few SIMD math libraries for some math functions. This is something that was not there earlier that we recently added on. Uh, there's some... Uh, already tuned functions, some trigonometric functions, some other math functions that are available that you could just directly link to and use them, invoke them in your code. Um, there is a feedback directed program restructuring tool that we'll be going uh, for in further detail, and in great detail, actually, uh, tomorrow. So the typical process is on the system simulator, um, you build an application and there is a utility that allows you to take that application from your development sandbox over to the cell system simulator. Um, it's, a, it's a local loopback mount feature that you can uh, use to uh, take the executable from your development sandbox and uh, once the system simulator comes up, it is, it is actually creating a virtual cell blade environment and you can copy it over there. It's as simple as just copying it over there and running it. 
supported languages are C, C++, um, Fortran compiler, we're not completely there yet. The Fortran compiler is in the works. Um, it's not released yet, it's not stable yet. And an assembler. And there's a full-fledged GNU toolchain. It's a standard, uh, it's like a GCC toolchain, except that it's been modified to include support for cell hardware. Therefore, you would see PPU GCC, PPU G++ for C++ code. Uh, PPU32 would be for 32-bit uh, configurations, 32-bit Linux. Uh, and uh, there should be a PPU64, but I believe maybe in SD, SDK 2.0, it's been linked directly. The default is PPU, GCC would be PPU64. And there's a C++ language extensions uh, that we can take a quick look at the header file after this presentation is over. That's a heavily used one. Anytime uh, a standard code, you know, a simple scalar code needs to be converted to a cell code, there's a list of instructions. For example, uh, instead of doing the plus add, uh, you have to use the instruction SPU underscore add. So all these instructions are mentioned. Uh, in the API, it's a very uh, simple uh, uh, user-friendly API that, you, that we can take a quick look at after the presentation. This is our application binary interface and an instruction set architecture, ISA. All of these documents are very easily available on IBM Microelectronics website. And in general, like the regular uh, LD tool, uh, AS utility, uh, with any uh, uh, development environment, whatever uh, tools are there, are available for cell. The XLC compiler is an IBM uh, proprietary compiler. Uh, now it includes uh, support for cell. The advantage, um, the reason there's two compilers, GCC and XLC, uh, for cell is um, GCC doesn't have a lot of optimization support. Uh, XLC has got uh, a lot of di different levels of optimizations, 01 through, uh, o, uh, all the way through 05. And uh, O2 onwards, we start, you know, there are some automatic optimizations that get, uh, um, in that get into effect once you build with that optimization flag. Uh, automatic loop unrolling, uh, uh, introduction of no ops, code restructuring, um, function inlining, some of these things happen automatically. And therefore, if you're compiling some code in the cell uh, software development kit on the, your x86 box, if you compile it with GCC, You'll, and you see the performance numbers, and we'll go over all those uh, in the lab sessions. And you convert it over to XLC and try to just you know, use the same code uh, with XLC that you're bound to see some um, performance uh, gain, uh, assuming that there's no false dependencies in the loops. Okay. There's uh, two different kinds of simulation models uh, mutually existing. Uh, one is functional only simulation for code development and debugging. Again, we'll go over all these in the lab sessions. There's uh, extensive tools available for performance simulation also. In other words, you can look at the queues, you can look at the pipelines, you can look at the performance statistics. Uh, in other words, after you run a simple program, um, how many cycles did it take? What is the CPI, cycles per instruction count? Uh, how many stalls were there? Um, how many latencies were there, all those things uh, come up in a nice uh, graphical interface that will allow you to uh, evaluate your application and see what are the performance roadblocks. The SPE runtime management library uh, uh, gives the support for all um, fun uh, function calls that allow you to create threads. Uh, when I say thread, uh, the main, uh, as Duke went over this morning, the PPEs and SPEs mutually coexist. There's a reason why SPEs or SPUs are, are called synergistic processing elements, right? Uh, why are they synergistic? Because PPEs are, PPE is basically just a control intensive um, uh, uh, processor. It cannot be used as a workhorse for number crunching algorithms. The SPEs are the workhorses. So all the PPE does once your main application starts is the main application resides on the PPE. It looks at the data buffers. And then PPE controls creation of all these, there's eight SPEs that you can use to your benefit. So PPE will create threads, eight threads, and if it's a full cell blade with two uh, cell processors, 16 SPEs. So you can create up to 16 threads. So um, the PPE cannot basically do computationally intensive tasks. It's good at control intensive tasks and control the task switching. 
the SPEs are more adept at handling, say, very uh, tens of millions of loops, repeated computations. But they cannot run an operating system on their own. So the PPEs need SPEs, and the SPEs need the PPEs. But they both mutually coexist. And so SPEs are called what they're called, which is synergistic processing elements. So there's a few runtime API that this runtime management library supports. The question was, um, uh, how much of the task, how much does the programmer have to take responsibility uh, when it comes to creating these tasks or assigning tasks to these numerous processing elements, right? So um, the <laughs> answer is good and bad. Uh, a lot, if, uh, if you're a bare, down, bare to metal programmer, a lot of control exists in the hands of the programmer. So in other words, you can decide if it's an image processing algorithm, say, for example, and there is three different stages to it. And you want four SPEs to work on one stage. So you know that your application is using up four SPEs. You are left with four. And you can use for the second stage, if there's no dependencies between the first and second, you can use another two because you know that this, doesn't, this task does not, need, does not have a lot of data to be split up and code to be split up between the two SPEs. And also, probably there's no dependencies. So use two. And then for the third stage, use two. Now, that load balancing uh, responsibility, assigning tasks, splitting the data up, moving the data to the uh, SPEs, all is in the hands of the programmer. So unfortunately, yes, there is a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of design issues uh, also to be considered. So all, more time spent on the, doing uh, these um, observations, uh, data movement, locality of data, dependencies, everything, uh, the better it is uh, once the code is executed. That being said, uh, we are continuously working with tools vendors, um, also internally in-house development of tools that takes these responsibilities away from the hands of the programmer. Uh, a lot of times in, in, in the industry, people just want to write quick, high-performance program applications, but don't really want to deal with, oh, God, I have to create memory. I have to send it over there. I have to make sure that it reaches, and then I have to write it back to the main memory. Um, so there are some tools. One example is a RapidMind development platform. We have joined hands with a rapid mind development platform. They are a new company, but they are rapidly, uh, they have uh, ensured quite a few uh, VC backed funding. And um, their, uh, their programming model is uh, basically one program fits all processing elements. In other words, the same code can be run on GPUs, say, the same road. If you, you take the code and move it over to cell, uh, cell processors, it'll run just fine move it over to some Intel multi-core uh, architectures, it'll just run fine, and you don't have to change the code. On top of that, what the platform does is you can use your same um, development sets. You don't, do, you don't need to change your compilers. All you need to do is link with their library and convert your code, convert your code into their RapidMind development uh, platform APIs. So in other words, use their uh, structures to create arrays of data and things like that. Uh, it has got a backend detector, which basically does uh, evaluates the platform to see what hardware it is. And at runtime, it just makes sure that the executable is converted to that format to run on that hardware. Also, the fact is uh, they take care of splitting up data. The platform is based on uh, data level parallels. There is, they automatically do the optimizations. So you don't really need to uh, split your, uh, take care of any kind of memory uh, DMA operations, any synchronization issues, nothing. You just take your scalar program, use their data types. You don't even have to parallelize it. Obviously, there are some uh, things that you have to keep in mind, things like uh, structuring of data. Um, there is a way that you uh, define the arrays and initialize the arrays so that parallelism is, is possible. So things like that have to be kept in mind, but uh, it makes programming uh, one notch easier. And there's another platform, um, Juday, that also helps. Like, so Simd Math Library has got some math functions that you can use. Um, there's another library, Mathematical Acceleration Subsystem Library, which is an IBM proprietary library uh, that was uh, initially supported in BlueGene and AIX. And now it has support uh, on CellBlade 2. It's just been released. Uh, there is a prototype version out there. But again, for uh, those of you who are involved with uh, HPC applications based on uh, use of a lot of math functions, please feel free to try this library out. 
So uh, the libraries are, uh, they have both vector and scalar functions. They are thread safe completely, uh, support both 32 and 64 bit uh, compilations. Um, and uh, in order to uh, use these functions, all you need to do is just link to the library and uh, you should be able to use all their APIs. And uh, these are the samples packages that, is there, that are there in the system simulator. Um, we will go over these in the lab sessions uh, where all these workloads are. For example, if you just want to see how the FFT workload looks like uh, using the cell API, um, there is a workload already there which is tuned and optimized to be working on a cell blade and it's gotten uh, very good impressive results and, and the benchmark slide that took just went over. There's a few, there's a sample image processing code. Um, there's a newly include, uh, included software managed cache which is a very useful um, library. Um, basically it gives, uh, using this software managed cache there's a few workloads that IBM demoed out, uh, out at different conferences. Uh, we can show you a few demos, uh, we have it on our laptops. Uh, sometime in the afternoon maybe we can kick off with some good demos. Um, and again all these uh, workloads are there in the system simulator for you to take a look at with the source code. Um, samples has again some, some, some sample code. Uh, the performance utilities, uh, we will go in detail in the, uh, on the, about, about uh, SPU timing tool, how it is used for, for static code analysis. Uh, currently it uh, the output that it produces in, involves a lot of assembly. So, um, so if the if if you're not from an assembly background, uh, it might be a little hard uh, for you. But then the option is uh, VPA, the Visual Performance Analyzer, uh, that Duke will cover tomorrow. That will give you uh, an option to see the source code along with the disassembly. Uh, cell ID is just based on the, the Eclipse development uh, tool. So this is pretty similar, it's just uh, added support. Um, it's the same Eclipse IDE, it's just got support for cell development too. So in other words, you can write code and build your application on the IDE itself. And it's got support for uh, debugging also. So it's a standard, uh, the same GDB in, uh, interface, uh, uh, GDB tool that's there for more common uh, Linux OSs. Uh, the same uh, commands, the same uh, uh, syntax for triggers, breakpoints, uh, listing of variables, all is uh, the same, okay? These are the installation requirements when you're ready to install uh, the cell de development platform. These are some instructions that you can refer to and all this material is there on your CD for reference and it's also available on the websites and uh, numerous websites. Uh, these are some dependencies, so sometimes if you are running, say, Red Hat, you might need to upgrade a Tickle uh, uh, TCL or TK uh, library or you, know, you download a different version of GCC. So these are some heads up uh, you know, instructions that we wanted to give you. They might, you might need to upgrade to make, upgrade to make 3.0 or 3.8, depending upon what your enterprise version of Linux is. And similarly, all these are package, package dependencies that you might need to want to watch out for. And anytime you have, there is some kind of question and there is a, a technical issue that you're having, we have a, something called the Developer Works Forums. A lot of people, game developers, university uh, faculty, uh, researchers, cell developers, Linux kernel folks visit these sites, also actively monitored by IBM uh, cell developers. Uh, and so you can post a question over there and uh, you can definitely get, expect to get some response. Again, the install component, components for x86 platforms and PPC64 platforms is just some information. This list of RPMs in SDK 2.0, these are all for your reference so that you can uh, anytime pull up your CD and um, refer to this. Very easy way of installing, uninstalling. And cell SDK is the install script basically. So all you need to do to install the development kit is download the ISO file. There's one place on developer works where the ISO file is available. Download the ISO file, run the script, script with the install option and that's it. Your development kit would be yeah, installed. And again, clear instructions for installing the cell IDE is also here. 
the makefile uh, environment, we, the, st the development kit comes with a standard makefile environment. Uh, we will go over that in the afternoon also. Uh, but basically, there is a set of default makefile structures that you can use, uh, a standard base level makefile, any application. Say, for example, you're writing a simple application to do DMA transfers. There will be a standard base level makefile. And there will be two directories for the SPU code resides in one directory and the PPU code resides in another directory. So the SPU code will have its own makefile because it's a completely different architecture. So there cannot be one makefile for both uh, kinds of, uh, both processing units. So there's another makefile for the PPU. And um, so ultimately with the final binary that you get, the SPU binary executable is embedded in the PPU binary and they're all clubbed to have be one binary. So that's all you need to run on the uh, system simulator or a cell blade. And again, there's uh, environment variables to switch the compilers from GCC to XLC and back. And in a t like a typical make file, there's a make.footer and make.header with all the standard environment variables. A lot of times, uh, and usually this happens a lot in, in real applications, is that you cannot have use those default make files. You can write your own make files in that case. Okay. These are the environment variables to switch the compilers. Make.env is at the top level of the development kit with all these variables defined and you can change the values either in the make.env file or in the command prompt. You can do a export ppu underscore compiler equals xlc to switch from GCC. And um, in order to, uh, if you are using the standard uh, default make files that come with the development kit, uh, it's recommended that you export this variable cell underscore top. This is used in a lot of sample programs. So if this variable is not set, it won't be able to you find the header file locations. So um, do export this uh, value so that when you do just go to the samples directory and do make, the path is all visible to the make files. And these are the standard make file variables. Program underscore PPU defines what is the name of the PPU executable. If it's a 64-bit executable, accordingly use the, say, the program underscore PPU 64 variable. Library underscore embed, it basically creates a linked library uh, from an SPU program, as it says, uh, to be embedded into the final PPU executable. And this is done, um, and I want to go over that later on when we go over the basic programming concepts, um, because we want the variables that are there in the PPU executable to be visible to the SPE, and vice versa. So that's why uh, we came up with something called CSOF, um, cell embedded, SPU executable format. Um, so basically, so whenever a PPE, in a PPE application, it creates a global reference. That will be the same executable name for the SPE executable. So because of this global reference, anything that's there in the SPE environment will be visible to PPE. So it's possible to basically move data back and forth. And again, we'll see that via program code and um, additional uh, diagrams. Uh, in the next presentation. There's a sample uh, make file for a project. So if there's a sample directory, sample is the directory where your uh, code will exist. There'll be an SPU directory with the two, uh, 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 say for example, the sample code name is S sample underscore SPU, make file will look like that. Program underscore SPU will define the sample SPU name. Library embed will create the archive file and include path will uh, give the uh, link to the uh, include path and uh, include the make.footer from the standard um, make file environment for the, that comes with the development kit and similarly for the PPU. Now if you see in the PPU uh, directory there is a variable called imports which will be linking with the archive file uh, which will be linking uh, with the archive file that is there in the SPU directory. So this is how it embeds this SPU, the sample SPU, with the final sample uh, executable that is produced as a result of the compilation. So finally, what's run on the simulator or a cell blade is this sample file, but, it all, but it, it's got embedded in it the SPU side of the executable also. So the Linux kernel support is uh, similar to traditional uh, um, Linux support, just a few differences. Um, for example, let's see. A large, uh, there is, 
a few similarities and few differences obviously uh, the PPE's Linux kernel is uh, is similar to Linux on power uh, and, and and as Duke went over this morning, it, the the PowerPC core is based on PowerPC 970, but it's a really stripped down version of PowerPC 970. One of the reasons that it is stripped down is basically to save on the cost uh, and the heat, the power uh, factor, and simplify the hardware in general, so that while we're uh, you know doing this ascent on performance, the heat uh, is the the wattage is low. So cell, I believe, is 32 watts, which is pretty good uh, compared to what the market standards are. <coughs> so uh, the Linux kernel basically have hand, has support for virtual memory, including, uh, and, and there's a diagram coming up later on that will explain this effective address space versus uh, the local store address space. It has supports for uh, it has support for large pages. By default, it's 4K in general, just like it is usually. Uh, but however, you can turn on large pages support using the huge uh, TLBFS command. Uh, it, I think you can go up to um, 64 KB, uh, 1 MB, and uh, maximum you could go to is 16 MB. So uh, PPE code can create something uh, called a Linux task. So in a way, uh, you can split, the, the application can split uh, the um, can create different Linux, Linux tasks, and these tasks can in turn create like an SPE thread. Now the SPE thread is nothing but uh, just a group of data with its own main program. And once you create the thread, it just runs asynchronously. So you have no, the PPE has no control once that lin the SPE thread is created. And it has a unique identifier just like you would create, it's just like a, a normal P thread. And again, all these SPE threads can be created in one group. So in other words, you can create all these SPE threads and assign them to one group. So you can query status on that group on completion of a particular task. And if each SPE thread has to belong to at least one thread group. And this is a table, uh, again, it's uh, from the programming handbook which basically defines how we are, when we're saying Linux thread versus SPE task or SPE thread, how is it different? Basically, Linux thread is just a thread running on the PPE Linux OS. Um, the cell broadband engine Linux task, Linux task is just a personalized way of saying that, yes, this is my task. It, will, uh, it can create two or three SPE threads. And so it's just basically modularizing your application to a certain extent. Now the SPE thread has its own environment. Again, you know, once the thread is created, it's, it, it uses all the resources, resources it has got available. It has got its own program counter. It has got its own memory flow controller, which is responsible, which has a DMA controller inside it and a channel interface to send messages back and forth from the PPE to the SPE. And then there are some synchronization commands for communication between SPE to SPE. It has got its own 128 uh, entry, 16-byte uh, register file. And MFC command queues are nothing but just uh, queues where you can queue in DMA commands. So that's a very neat feature that if you have to issue three or you know maybe 10 DMA commands at one time, they can be queued. So PPE versus SP comparison, uh, let's look at a few differences. Uh, both of them have SIMD operation support single instruction, multiple data. Uh, in the presentation this morning, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a chart which uh, showed the way the, the data is laid out. Um, when we talk about vectors, vector is nothing but just a bunch of consecutive memory locations. So in other words, if we have an array of say float A4, so it's 16 bytes of memory. So instead of saying float A4, you would say vector float A. So that's basically equivalent to uh, a float four times 16 bytes. So it's just uh, a different, uh, it's just a name given to address 16 bytes of consecutive memory locations. And there's no difference the way they are, uh, uh, they are uh, positioned in memory. It's same as a scalar. It's just that when we define a vector, and you try to load a vector, it loads 16 bytes at a time. That's where the benefit comes because 
uh, compared to scalar programming versus vector programming, you're not doing 16 lo or four loads. That itself gives a huge benefit because the load, the, the fewer loads and stores you do, the better. So instead of uh, doing, uh, if you're doing a computation on say 16 bytes of data, in a normal scalar program, you would do four loads, okay? So um, both SP and PP have SIMD operation support. So um, they have their own VMX instruction set. VMX is Vector Multimedia Extension. This is something that uh, was created with traditional PowerPC uh, architectures. Um, IBM is one of the foremost, actually it is the foremost uh, to do uh, multi-core technology. Uh, initially it did the, the, uh, the two core uh, power four that it released was for the first of its kind in the industry. So, um, and this is just the cell broadband engine, and that's the reason Sony and Toshiba, you know, came to IBM. That yes, you're the chip guru. If you think, if you if you think about the gaming consoles, Nintendo, right, is an IBM chip. Um, I, 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 Microsoft Xbox is an IBM chip, and finally, cell broadband engine is an IBM chip. Um, so, uh, basic, and so uh, for cell broadband engine. We are using the standard VMX instruction set, so the PowerPC unit does have the VMX instruction support. Some of the instructions uh, from traditional PowerPC 970 may not be supported, but a lot of them are. Um, let's see. So SPEs have a different uh, kind of uh, VM, uh, vector instruction support available, and again, we'll be going over some of those instructions very soon. And because they are so different architecturally, they need different compilers. So PP has uh, 32 uh, reg uh, SIMD registers, whereas SPE has got 128 16-byte wide registers. Um, SPE has got a unified register file, whereas PPE has got different registers for handling fixed-point computations, uh, floating-point arithmetic, vector multimedia registers. Load latency in PPE is variable because there's an L1 cache and there's an L2 cache, and then there is the main memory. So any um, Load operation cannot be deterministic because you don't know if you know where it's going to come from. It's going to come from the caches. Will there be a cache miss or a hit? Uh, so we don't know. Versus SPE is a very deterministic environment. No exceptions, uh, no caching. Very simple. So in other words, just you know, um, to computationally calculate the calculate the performance number for any app, given application, it's very straightforward. You can, uh, in theory, uh, did. Uh, construe what the performance number will look like. SPE is currently optimized for single precision float. PP does not have double precision flo uh, floating point uh, support. Um, let's see. Currently, um, the single precision floating point support is very good, over 200 gigaflops. Uh, SP, the PP is also good, comparable to the other um, uh, platforms. Uh, but it's not, uh, it doesn't give as good a scale of as single precision yet. We have a roadmap, we're working on the next few years, we'll have better double precision floating point performance. As of now, it's just comparable, but we cannot boast off with a 30x or 20x performance benefit when it comes to double precision applications. Again, this is a table. Uh, most of the data types are supported, unsigned care, signed care. Uh, it's just that every uh, variable will be preceding the word vector in it. So in other words, uh, vector unsigned CAR will be having 16 bytes of data in them. So when you create a vector unsigned CAR, uh, keep in mind that you're creating 16 consecutive bytes in memory. Same, a similar uh, unsigned long, long support is there, int support double, uh, standard data types are also supported on SPEs. It's just that when we say vector unsigned short, it is four short variables in that um, vector. When we say vector unsigned care, it's 16 bytes of scalar data types inside that one vector. When we say double, it's two uh, double variables inside that vector. And these are the language extension. When I say language extension, it's just a different API instruction set that you have to use uh, if, you want, if you want to convert a scalar application to vector application. This is the communication part. Um, so. There is three different mechanisms by which you can communicate to the SPE. Uh, take a real-world example. You have your main program that you have built on the PPE. 
Now, there is these data buffers that you need to move over to the SPE to do some really rigorous computation. So in order to send this data from the PP to the SPEs, we have something called DMA. It's just nothing but doing a simple command which says, from this effective address in the main memory, send in these many bytes over to the local store in this SPE. SP 0 through N, 0 through 7. So pick an SPE, send these many bytes. So once those bytes are there, do the computation on the SPE, do MFC put, memory flow controller underscore put. So once that data buffer is used, put those results back in main memory. Sometimes what you could do is do something like shared I.O. buffers to save uh, you know, uh, the buffer space. Um, when you send a buffer of data to the SPE, once the results are computed, you overwrite that buffer and send it back to the PPE. And uh, so when, when we're using things like this, there, there comes a need of synchronization. Sometimes uh, you want to know if a particular uh, section of data from, main from the main memory has uh, already done some task. So another SP might be dependent on one stage one of image processing or it's trying to do something on that on a particular data set and say SPUN cannot even start until that stage is done. So then there needs to be synchronization variables or mailbox messages. A mailbox message is nothing but uh, a simple 32-bit message that you can send over a channel interface to the SPE to say, I'm done. And then you can start off, trigger off the next stage. There's two mailboxes, the SPE write outbound mailbox. Whenever we say write or read or inbound or outbound, the reference point or get or put, the reference point is always an SPE. So if I say put, it means putting from the SPE into the main memory that the PPE is uh, seeing. PPE does loads and stores from the uh, uh, PPE, the way it access main memory is by load and store from the main memory over to the register file that it has. The SPE has access to the main memory only via DMA operations. So in other words, SPE cannot do load and store into the main memory directly. It needs to get the data from the main memory into the local store and then do an instruction fetch. There is something called signal notification channels. You can configure them to be atomic. And uh, this illustrates what I just mentioned. When we say get, it basically means transfer data into an SPE. So get into the SPE. When we say put, we mean putting the data back to the PPE. And this is a storage domain. This makes, this puts it all into perspective, whatever we have discussed so far, right? So here is the PPE. It has got its own processing units and it has got, got its own register files. And here is the main mem, the DRAM memory, right? And this is one typical SPE. So the SPE is nothing but a combination of the SPU. SPU has got some processing units, the arithmetic, uh, you know, processing units, and a combination of local, st oops, local store, which is just flat memory, 256 kilobyte flat memory. So it is single ported uh, flash mem um, flat memory. So it's only one uh, read-write port. So all the loads and stores, uh, DMA operations, and instruction fetch all happen through that one port. Um, my mouse. So the way the PPE communicates, this is the EIB, the Element Interconnect Bus, high, very, very high bandwidth bus. This is a great asset to this whole architecture because this is the bus that makes it possible to use cell in a cluster environment form the basis of all these supercomputing um, nodes. So, let's see. And it's a fully coherent bus. The whole DRAM memory is fully coherent. So, uh, and the way we implement coherency in memory and bus is via, via the SNOOP protocol. Um, so the way the PPE communicates with the SPE is by uh, writing to these memory mapped I.O. registers. So it does reads and writes to this memory mapped I.O. registers to send or receive data. The way the SPE sends data to the PPE is by writing to this DMA, to this memory flow controller via channel commands. So this is the way the SPEs communicate with other SPEs and the PPE communicates with, communicate with other SPEs also.
So PPE just directly does load and store from the DRAM memory. The SPE will have to do a DMA operation, get the data into the local store and then read it from the local store. So local storage is 256 kilobyte, ECC protected, single ported, non-caching memory. Um, it, the instruction prefixes are 128 bytes per cycle. Data access bandwidth is 16 bytes per cycle. And all loads and stores on the PPE or the SPE are, have, to be, have to be aligned on 16 byte boundaries. If it's not aligned on 16 byte boundaries, there, wouldn't, there won't be a trap, there won't be anything. It will automatically truncate the last four bits. So, you know, it will force it. So it is just automatically enforced. So we really recommend there's attributes, there's macros that, will, that we can use to our benefit when we're writing the code or defining an array that will automatically define it you know, on a 16 byte boundary. So a quad word is 16 bytes in this, in, in this case. A word is 32 bits and a quad word would be 16 bytes, which is the size of uh, one cache line request. All cache line transfers on a, are on a 128 byte boundary and all loads and stores are on a 16 byte boundary. So they have to be aligned. If there's a DMA transfer that's going on, it has to be aligned on a 128 uh, byte cache line boundary. And if it's a um, load and store, it has to be aligned um, always on a 16 byte boundary. And again, SPU can only fetch instructions from its own local store. And obviously, there's no address translation. There is uh, the privileged software on the PPU can set up effective address aliases to the local store. 